Say it now. Say the obvious prediction right now. The Stars are going to win the Stanley Cup. Hey guys, and welcome back to Starcastic Remarks alongside just myself today. Uh, I gave both of them the day off. No, I'm just kidding. They're they're both busy here today, but we are the official Dallas Stars podcast of THPN. Thank you to DraftKings Sportsbook for being our sponsor. Use that promo code THPN the next time you are there. I am in the Dallas area today, so as you can see, my, my background is a little different than it normally is. I'm in the Dallas Stars room, and... We have a lot of exciting things to talk about. The Stars, for the first time since 2016, are the division winners. They have a six-point lead over both, or it might even be seven, five or six points, one of those two, over the Jets and also the Colorado Avalanche. So there is no hope for either one of those teams to clinch the division, and Dallas will take home ice advantage, at least it appears like, for at least the first three rounds of the playoffs, assuming we get to the conference final there. Yeah, lots of things to talk about here tonight, you guys. But uh, if you would like to call in today, the f- I'm going to open up the phone lines uh, today since it is, I am here by myself. 214-810-1740 if you want to be a part of the show. And just kind of let me know your thoughts and what you're uh, thinking going through this game, what you're thinking going through the rest of this weekend through next week, we've only got one game left before the playoffs start on Saturday. Uh, we don't know if the stars are going to start the playoffs on Saturday, but we know that the general NHL playoffs will start then. Uh, as always, uh, we're going to start off with just a couple of my notes when I'm here alone, but general thoughts from this game. I, I didn't like the way the stars were playing offensively today. It, it was just like the last game against the jets and the fact that, the the crispness of the passes that they normally are able to make, especially the top three lines, were not really there today. However, what was on point for a majority of the game was their team defense overall. And Otter, again, he he was spot on. And the the one goal he let in was a bad turnover. And it, it, it you know Mira Haskinen was just a little bit out of position, not expecting that to. Uh, not expecting that turnover to happen. So I don't really fully blame Otter for that. But other than that, he was good. The team defense was good. And that's exactly what you want to see in uh, the way that the Stars played, especially after that 3 to nothing loss to the Winnipeg Jets. So 
at the time of this recording, the last I saw the end of the second period between the Winnipeg Jets and the Colorado Avalanche, the score was seven to nothing at the second intermission. So the Jets are maybe they're going to be hot going into the playoffs. I would not want to be facing them right now. And thank goodness the Colorado Avalanche appear to be the ones who are going to be playing them in the first round. So the Stars will either have the Vegas Golden Knights, the LA Kings, or the Nashville Predators. Right now, they have a more than 50% chance of having the Vegas Golden Knights in the first round, which really sucks because we have to beat the St- the reigning Stanley Cup champions in the first round. But again, it would be kind of nice for the Stars as well to kind of get that out of the way if they're able to to win that first series. And then, yeah, there's not much pressure on them after that, assuming uh, they go into the second round playing either the the Jets or the Avalanche. So I'm I'm really excited for the Stars' chances against the team. And I know a lot of people are talking right now about, oh, well, I, I would much rather play Nashville or, you know, I'd much rather play blah, blah, blah the way the stars are playing right now and the way they have taken care of business, especially defensively the last month, I don't think it matters who the stars play. They're going to play the same way. And if it doesn't work, then they'll adjust and they'll, I think they're still going to win. I really don't think it matters. When you look at the, the records between those three teams, obviously you, you want to play the, the LA Kings because the LA Kings have not been good against the stars and the stars have had their number for some reason. We have not been good against the Vegas Golden Knights this season. I think they're three and zero against us, or two zero and one, or something like that. I, I forget exactly what it was. And then uh, Nashville would not be an easy series either to be to be completely honest with you, because obviously one of the things that we talk about is that crazy goal that Hawk and Paw scored with seconds remaining. They scored two goals in less than ten seconds in order to win the game. So. I, I mean, it, it really doesn't matter when you get to the playoffs who you play. All the teams are good, and you're just going to have to fight your way through. And what's different about this year compared to other years is last year they really had to fight through it, and they came up just short, just short. And they have that experience now, all those players that were here last year. And on top of that, now they've got a Duchesne and a Tanev and a couple of extra guys who have gone through the playoffs, who have won Stanley Cups. And it, it's just really nice to know that they can rely on that experience when things get tough. It, it, they are going to get tough in the playoffs. But I am very excited for the Stars' chance against any of those three opponents. Okay, let's get into the game today. Right off the bat, uh, 17 minutes remaining. Dallas had a turnover. Seattle had a chance. They had a three-on-two. Seattle did as well. Borgen had a shot on an Essa Lindell turnover, but Essa would uh, kind of recover in this game. It was not a great pass through the neutral zone, and there were a couple of those in the games tonight. Uh, Ty Cartier, uh, by the way, he's a he is somebody that I would want in my bottom six if uh, I had that opportunity. He fans on an opportunity off the rush, and the Seattle forecheck, about 12 and a half minutes remaining in the first, was really giving Dallas defense... Uh, th- was giving the Dallas defense problems. And I didn't really agree with the assessment by the ESPN group. I honestly thought the stars started kind of slow and Seattle was way better. And, and they were even saying that Seattle was even better as the game went further. And yeah, they had more shots and especially like one of my notes, I put three and a half minutes remaining shots were seven to two Seattle. So but a lot of the shots were from distance and they weren't like serious high danger chances in that first period. But nonetheless, I thought Seattle had the, the better first period. I, I mean, Ben had a shot that was a, a really good chance from uh, Tanev giving him the stretch pass. Uh, Cartier had a shot off the rush. Uh, let's see. Uh, Pavelski that th- I got frustrated with him. It was a two on one. He tried to pass it across. I think it was to hints and, I yelled, red. I was like, shoot the puck, Pavelski. And then the ESPN broadcast also kind of agreed with me there. And then even 30 seconds later, Pavelski had another chance, and it was a great pass from Duchesne there, but it was an even better save by Grubauer. Uh, Stankoven. Stankoven had a fantastic game tonight. He was first forcing turnovers left and right, and especially on the forecheck, which is something he is fantastic at. And he, obviously he's worked at, considering that he is a short, uh, shorter and smaller guy. He, he just has to work harder at that sort of stuff. It's just the way that it is. 
and he he actually turned the puck over at one point with like a minute remaining, and then he got it right back. So he is uh, kind of mopping up his own mistakes. And then obviously with literally 1.6 seconds remaining in the first period, Smith scored with a tip from a robo point shot, and that would put the Stars up one to nothing. I didn't think the Stars deserved to have a one to nothing lead going into the first intermission, but you know what? We'll take it. Honestly, I thought Seattle was the better team in the first period, but the Stars did get better as the period went along. It They sort of kind of started a little slow, in my own opinion, but that's just me. Going into the second period, uh, there was a good defensive play by Nils at 16.04, but Dallas would go on the penalty kill. Fox, uh, his first of two penalties in the game, he would trip Larson, and it was a little frustrating for me because it was an offensive zone penalty. You don't want to take offensive zone penalties. Those are the worst kind to take. But during that power play for Seattle, they were having a really rough time trying to get it going, and they weren't able to get anything going during that power play. Dallas would kill it off, and really the only thing they had was a uh, Jaden Swartz backhand chance in tight, and it, I mean, Otter made easy work of it. But as the as the penalty was kind of expiring, there was a little bit of chaos around Ottinger and Seattle was looking for rebounds, but Dallas eventually would get it cleared and would get it out. Shots were five to one Seattle with seven minutes into going into seven minutes into the second period. And so the stars sort, I mean, getting out shot, but I, again, I didn't think it was like terrible. I it just, they were really focusing on the defensive aspect of the game and really making sure that they focused in on their own zone. And by the way, one of the things that kind of makes me think that that is something they were doing on purpose. That was one of the things that Ottinger talked to uh, Steve Levy of ESPN in, in an interview in the post game show where he mentioned that that was one of the things Dallas was focusing on 1240. Everly would have a chance, but he couldn't get it cleanly. And then it was back to back to back. And it was, for the next three chances, it would be Stank Stankoven for the Stars, uh, Seattle for a chance, which I didn't get the person's name because it went by so fast. Ben had a chance. And then at 11.08, this was the controversial play in the game. Borgen puts his hand over the puck, and it should have been a goal, but the rest blew the whistle. And instead of a goal, a penalty shot was awarded to Sam Steele. Now, they... Uh, Grubauer would make the save on the penalty shot, which made it even more frustrating because I was ho kind of hoping that Steele could just score the goal and make it a moot point in the fact that it didn't count, but that should have been a goal. It should have been counted. The Dallas Stars should have been up 2 to nothing at that point, and maybe that even changes the complete aspect of the game going into the third period. However, after that, Tolvin in from an extreme angle would get a shot, and Dallas turned the puck over twice to Seattle in their own zone on that particular chance for Tolvanen. Dumoulin in the high slot just misses. That was probably the most dangerous chance that they had up to that point in the second. Johnson got pulled down. It could have obviously been called and easily been called, but there was none by the rest there. It looked like a four-on-two for Seattle at 7-10 remaining, and then there were some really, really good back-checking by the Dallas Stars in order to make sure that that four and two did not translate into anything dangerous for Seattle at six 35. Uh, there was a point shot by Dallas or some traffic in front, but nothing would come of that. And then at four minutes, Miro would have a chance on the tip flying through the slot. And it was Robertson uh, playing the role of breadwinner and trying to get that pass to the slot to Miro. And, Right on, on the ensuing rush going the other way, Miro had a really, really good defensive play to stop a cross zone pass off the rush for Seattle. So Miro with a good offensive play and a defensive play in his own zone going both ways. Dallas would go on the power play at 138 remaining. It was Riker Evans, who, by the way, that's an awesome name. He would hook Johnston. And then about 22 seconds later, Dallas would go five on three on the power play. And it would be for a minute and 38 seconds. And it was actually Brandon Tanev who tried to go in shorthanded and get a chance. And he basically just goalie bowled Ottinger. A lot of people were really scared and worried about Ottinger being hurt. I, I didn't think he was injured or I didn't think anything of it. He, he looked fine as soon as he got goalie bowled. So I wasn't too worried. But 
I was a little bit frustrated, and but to to Brandon Tanev's credit, he did try to get out of the way, but he just ran himself out of real estate and didn't do anything uh, to try and get out of the way to avoid goalie bowling, uh, Jay Gottinger. So with a minute thirty eight, this falls into the Sergey Zuboff rule of if you have forty five seconds or more of a five on three, you better score a goal. The Stars would, Robo would score. His power play goal, glove side, it was a brilliant shot. Uh, he absolutely whipped the crud out of that thing, and that put up that put Dallas up two to nothing. It's another late goal, late in the period for the Stars. Thirty seconds, thirty six seconds remaining in the second, and it, there was one more chance for Dallas as the period expired for Duchesne, and they would go into the second intermission two to nothing. I liked the second period a lot better than I did the first. There were more chances for Dallas especially towards the middle of the period, about the 13 to 10 minute mark remaining in that period. And what I've realized, and I, I told dad this as I was watching the game with him here, the stars appear to do way better when there's a little bit of helter skelter, if that makes any sense, a little bit of craziness when it's going back and forth each way, when they have some rush opportunities, it just feels like they're about to get a goal. And Honestly, they should have when when Borgen put his hand over the puck and then they blew the whistle early before the puck crossed the goal line. But nonetheless, that, that's what I'd like to see the Stars do a little bit more of. But again, I can't really complain because they focused on their defensive play today. And they were excellent. They allowed one goal and it was one bad turnover. And we'll talk about that when we get to it. Here's the third period. Uh, Eberle would have a chance off the rush. Larson would have a shot. Otter gets a piece, but he, he didn't know where it went after he made the original shot. Uh, after he made the original save, excuse me. Uh, Robo's shot would hit the post, and it goes over the back of the net. And then Eberle would hit the, the crossbar off the rush, and then there was a really good D play by Stankoven to get the puck out of the play. Essa needs to get that one out of out off the faceoff win at 14-21. That, that was one play I thought that Essa could have done a little bit better on. He, he had a couple of opportunities to get the puck out of the zone, and he, he was did not take care of business on those. But again, nothing came of either one of those chances for the Seattle Kraken, so all's fair. 13 minutes remaining. Smith had a chance after a turnover. Smith had a very good game tonight. Obviously, with he had the goal uh, to get the Stars on the board to begin the game. Uh, Bjork stranded would have a shot off the iron. And this is something I talked about on X. The stars were very fortunate that this game was not tied. It easily, easily could have been tied. So I know we didn't have a lot of puck luck in the last game against Winnipeg. And there have been other nights when the stars have not had puck luck, but they definitely had some extra puck luck here this afternoon. Miro would have a really good D play. And he did that about four times there in with, with 10 minutes or less remaining in the third period. It was just fantastic uh, again here today. Uh, Mason Marchman, he had a redirect that would miss. It was flying through the slot, very similar to the play that Miro had at the end of the second period. However, Dallas would go on the penalty kill. Duchesne would take a high-sticking penalty, and there was some really good D work by Ben and by Miro, like I said. and then. Miro Haskinen would put the Stars up 3 to nothing at 7.37 remaining. He would score after a, his centering pass got blocked, and he basically went around the net and roofed it. It was a great play by him, and he was able to get that goal. And that's another thing now that I'm thinking about it. The, the, something that's been different about this team in the last month compared to, I would say, the rest of the season is – when they've had their opportunities going into the third period and they only had like a two goal lead or a one goal lead, they, they get that insurance marker, that extra goal, which would allow them to make a mistake like they did here in the third period, right after this third goal. So then you can ease up, you can play a little bit looser and really make sure that you're playing your best game to kind of lock everything down. Now let's talk about that goal. Uh, Yamamoto, Yamamoto, excuse me, Kyler Yamamoto, former Edmonton Oiler, would score with a redirect right in front of Otter. And I, I can't believe we're talking about this again. But Nils Lundqvist, it, it Miro was out of position for that, but 
the reason why Miro p- was out of position for that is because he was expecting the puck to get out of the zone. So I don't really blame him for it. It was Nils who couldn't get the puck out of his own zone and it ended up in the back of his own net. So I, I mean, I don't know what else we're supposed to do to talk about Nils Lundqvist and try to make a reason for him to stay in the lineup when Hawk and Paw is ready to come back. I don't know if he's going to be back on Wednesday against the St. Louis Blues for the season finale. I don't know if that's the case or if Hawk and Paw is just going to get inserted into game one and the playoffs against Vegas, I'm assuming. I, I hope not because that's not something you would want to do uh, being Yanni Hawk and Paw, but that might just be the option, that the only option he's got. But there's, there is no argument to be made that Nils Lundqvist should stay in the lineup. There, there, there's not. He, he he made a really good D play, and I and in my notes I I wrote this down. That was the very first note that I made in the second period, and that he had a good D play. And otherwise, he was basically invisible, which is good for him because if he's invisible, that means he's taking care of his own duties in his defensive zone. And then he makes the really bad play. And, and again, you cannot have that, especially after you've gone up three to nothing. You've given yourself some momentum. You've given yourself some insurance marker to make sure that you're able to win the game. And then Nils Lundqvist goes and gives it up like that. And I, I know, I understand that he wasn't the only one that did it. Like I said, S. Lindell had two in particular during the game where he was not able to get it out. But that's just the nature of the beast. Essa's passes that were turnovers trying to get out of his own zone did not turn into goals. The one that Nils Lundqvist made was 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 an issue. So it it was the only one that counted and it counted against the Stars. So Dallas will go on to take to finish the game 3 to 1. They would win it mm-hmm. and uh it was excellent game by the Stars overall. I just don't know what else to say about uh Nils Lundqvist here, but uh, we do have somebody who called in. I don't know who you are, person. <laughs> Can you go ahead and tell me who you are and what you want to talk about? Hey, Ryan. Hey, Starcastic peeps. It's Ardell. Hey, Just Ardell. Calling in. I wanted to talk. Hey, I wanted to talk about the play of Chris Tanef. Uh, in this game, I mean, he, I think he, I don't know how many minutes he had, Ryan, but he just steady eats minutes. And I, I just, I'm so impressed with his game in terms of the little things that he does. We knew that he was tough. We, we joke that he's the hockey cockroach and he is, but he, he makes a lot of subtly subtle, good decisions with the puck. He, he moves it to the right places at the right times. He knows when to eat it. I just think he is, uh, I don't want to say he's a low key addition, Ryan, but he is a very, very good addition considering his experience level. And I think it's going to bear fruit in the playoffs. And that's, that's a really good point, Ardell, because when when you watch him play, he, he doesn't do like anything flashy, but he is secretly the exact player that the Stars needed. A right-handed guy who could play in your top four and be just ridiculous defensively. And it, it took him a little while to get acclimated, but I would say, especially in the last two weeks, there have been times when he's been the star's best defenseman, especially in his own zone. So he is the human cockroach, especially after that scary incident that he had a couple of weeks ago, (laughs) where it looked like he was going to be out. And uh, he, he is going to be a very key piece for the stars. And maybe this is the turning point for the stars. And when they got him that puts them over the top and them being a, being the Stanley cup contender that they are. So I, and that's a that's a very good point. I, I should have mentioned that uh, about Christina. So thank you for doing that. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate ex- appreciate expounding. I I just think Dallas, re- regardless of what happens with that third pairing, they have the personnel to kind of mix and match and move guys around. And I don't know if you've noticed, Ryan, but it seems like DeBoer has been kind of experimenting with different pairs. I saw Lundqvist and Miro out there. I think he's trying to get a feel for what his options are in the playoffs. And if you've already spoken to that earlier, forgive me, but it's just something I've noticed. I'm excited about this team, and I think they shored up a huge... It's amazing how one guy like Tanef can really help each pair because it gives them freedom to do things. Love the pod, man. Uh, the The Stars are undefeated when I wear my Starcastic Tuesday shirt. They, so uh, <laughs> today was the seventh win. Uh, I'm, I'm probably going to wear it to game one. Thanks for taking my call. Of course, man. Thanks for calling in. 
And uh, th- that is a good point as well. That is something that we have talked about in previous episodes. We hadn't really talked about it today very much, but that has been something that Pete DeBoer has kind of been doing. We, we've seen everything. We've seen Miro with Tanev sometimes. We've seen Tanev and Suter. We've seen Suter with, even with Miro at points, which we almost exclusively saw a bunch, especially last year. But it, it, it's, and, and again, I'll, I'll go into this a little bit. I don't know if it's necessarily like a bad thing or if it's a good thing that we're seeing this. And maybe it's a little bit of both. I I think it could be a good thing because if they need to put defensemen out there in a specific situation, then they can do that. So if you need somebody who has a little bit more of a steady hand defensively and you have one minute remaining in Game 7 against the Vegas Golden Knights, where it's 3-3 to in the series, and you need a face-off win, but just in case you lose the face-off, who are you going to put out there? I would put out Suter and Tanev. They are ha- they are our biggest veteran defensemen. They are our best defensive guys, and they always seem to make the right play in order to get out of our zone. By the way, Suter. We have not talked a lot about Suter and some of the hate that he has received. Uh, I have not seen that hate in months now, I would say. So he's doing his job, and he's playing excellent. And maybe that's just because, the, you know... Uh, and again, then maybe Nils Lundqvist is being more of the whipping boy right now or Yanni Hockenpah compared to Suter. But that just goes to show you how well Suter is playing uh, as of late. So uh, thank you, Ardell, for, for calling in. Really appreciate that. Um, I, I do want to do to talk about one more thing, and obviously this is the, the, the biggest news of the, the hockey world over this past week, and it just kind of exploded. It seemed to come out of nowhere, but obviously I'm talking about the relocation of the Arizona Coyotes to Salt Lake City. So it appears that is basically a done deal. Something could all obviously happen at the last second. Somebody could say, oh, well, I want this thrown in the contract and, you know, it could all fall apart, you know, like like that. But based off of what I've heard and what I've listened to, I've listened to a ton of content when it comes to the relocation of the coyotes. And it, it seems like everyone is just down and depressed. And this is a thing that is happening. And I've seen insiders giving it a percentage of like 90 to 95% that this happens. Um, Motto, so did they lose the land bid? They did not lose the land bid, but I, I think what happened is they were just sick and tired of, you know, waiting for an arena to come around. And based off of what they would have to wait for, they would be playing in Mullet Arena for another three years. And they've already done it for two. So this is the NHL and the NHLPA kind of saying, you know, this is unacceptable. We're not going to be in a college arena for five years. And they, I mean, they gave him plenty of time, Alex Marowello, the owner of the Coyotes, to to take care of business and find a permanent solution for his club. And he was never able to really do that. So what is understood by several insiders is that all is not lost for Arizona hockey. It appears that in a five-year window that they could return as the Arizona Coyotes. Now, and here's what I mean. The Arizona Coyotes are moving to Salt Lake City. That seems to be a for sure thing. However, there are even more rumors of expansion, and it appears that one of the stipulations in the agreement for Marowello selling the Coyotes to the NHL and then in turn the NHL selling it to Ryan Smith, the guy who owns the Utah Jazz, is that he will get an expansion franchise within five years in order to bring the Coyotes back. Now, there's stipulations on Alex Marorello's part in order to make sure that his team has a building, and there's there's lots of other things that he has to fulfill in order for the NHL to reward him with a franchise again, and he's going to have to pay the expansion fee for the new Arizona Coyotes. However, and this is one of the things that I I hadn't talked about. Um, 
uh, I, I wrote a uh, a blog post about you know how I feel for the Arizona fan base and why it just really sucks for them. But one of the things I didn't get into is, you know, a lot of Arizona fans and a, a lot of hockey people in that community and in that market, they don't want to support a new franchise if Alex Maruello is the owner. So I, I, I don't know why the NHL would do this other than just to pry the franchise away from him and get him to agree to this. And maybe they put so many, you know, so many things on his to-do list before he can have that expansion franchise that he will never be able to, to, to finish that to-do list from the NHL. But if I was a, if I was an Arizona Coyote fan and Alex Marorello promised me all of these things and he said, I'm going to keep, the, the coyotes here in the desert and they're not going anywhere and I'm going to find a building for them. And then he turns around five years later and sells them. And by the way, it makes a profit off of it too, it, which is even more frustrating for Arizona fans. I'm sure then I wouldn't trust him, nor would I support a franchise in my own city in Phoenix. If he's the owner, I, I mean, I would, I would feel like that, honestly. I don't know how anybody else would feel like that, but if anybody else would feel like that, but th that seems logical to me. And uh, I watched uh, Craig Morgan and uh, I think it's uh, Steve Peters. I, I can't remember his name. He's a former coach, but uh, I watched their their podcast episode. It, it was it was basically a funeral. It was like an hour podcast after the game against the Edmonton Oilers. And even though they won that game, there was no jubilation. There was no excitement. It was just like, talked about the game for 10 minutes. And then for the rest of the 50 minutes, they talked about how frustrated and how sad they were that the team was moving. And that was, they they, they were just kind of going in circles about how sad they were. And, you know, going through comments of Arizona uh, coyote fans and then you know fans of hockey around the around the world honestly who feel really bad for that community and i'm one of them as well so i hope it works out for them in the end and they are able to get their franchise back and i, I hope and pray that it's not alex Maruello and that it's someone else um i forget the guy's name it's the, the owner of the the oh my goodness the, the Phoenix Suns. I, I couldn't remember their name. Uh, the basketball team. I think it's Ishabod is his last name. Matt Ishabod is a uh, a big basketball guy, but he's also from Minnesota or no, Michigan. So he understands hockey. And so, I mean, Michigan is a big hockey state. So that could be something that maybe he jumps in if Alex Mariello says, you know what? Never mind. I, I don't want to do this. And then he jumps in. And, you know, maybe he brings them into the Footprint Center where the Suns play, and that takes care of that. I don't know. But anyways, uh, for any Coyotes fans who, who who listen to our show, and there are a couple, there's not many, but there are a couple, I feel for you. I'm really, really, really sorry. I, I can't imagine what you must be feeling right now. And What's even worse is that it's just out in the open air and everybody is talking about it because there's not really anything else going on other than the end of the season. And I mean, other than the, you know, the wild card, figuring out who's going to be in the playoffs in the East, the West is already set for the playoffs and it, it we're just kind of dragging along to the finish line. And then this explodes up and it, I don't even think it took three or four days for the news to be like, nope, okay, we're 100% moving to Salt Lake City. So, uh, I, again, I feel really bad uh, for for Arizona, for the Phoenix area fans. And it, it's not like Phoenix is not a hockey market. They absolutely are. And I know some people will be like, oh, well, they don't have any fans and they didn't support their team. I mean, do you really blame them? The only time they made the playoffs in the last 10 to 15 years was the expanded playoffs in the bubble. And they won one round and then lost. They got destroyed 
by the Colorado Avalanche, I believe, in in the bubble. So I don't really blame them. They they, they were never given given a chance to succeed. And as much as I hate uh, Alex Marawello and how how bad this looks for him, this is one hundred percent on Gary Bettman. And yes, he's gotten better at putting franchises in in cities. Obviously, you can look at the the success that the Vegas Golden Knights have had and also the Seattle Kraken. This is on him more than anything because they 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 played in Footprint Center for a couple of years. They moved to Gila River Arena and then they the last two years they've spent in a college arena that doesn't even hold 5,000 people. The the Texas Stars Arena is bigger than the arena the Arizona Coyotes play at played out of the last two years. And, and and yeah, that was the other thing I was I was gonna mention is from a from a hockey standpoint, from a professional hockey standpoint, th- there are guys in the NHL who are very good players who are from the Phoenix area. And now I know the Chuck the Kachucks are technically from, you know, from Canada, obviously Keith being from Canada, but he or actually was he? I, I I'll renege that for a second, but Regardless, it, he, it, but specifically Austin Matthews, who looks like he's going to be one of the best goal scorers of our generation, is from the Phoenix area. Same thing with Matthew Nice up there in Toronto as well. They've they've got two uh, Arizona boys up there in Toronto who are playing for Canada's glory team, whatever. And then uh, Tage Thompson as well, who is also playing in, for the Buffalo Sabers, who is also from the. Phoenix area as well. So it's it's not like they haven't had, you know, success in the, the professional level getting kids into the NHL or something like that. It's just that this team was not given a chance to succeed. And it really sucks for those, especially for those kids who that I I can't imagine if my stars were like this and they were moving. I, I would be completely devastated i would and i but again i can't even imagine or begin to understand how some of these kids who are diehard fans of the arizona coyotes how much they must feel right now and it's 100 percent on gary bettman and 100 percent on alex marillo so i hate to end it on a on a sour note like that on a sad note but that that's just the way that it is and whether they get a franchise back or not, uh, whether they choose to root for the, the new Salt Lake city team, I, I, I don't know what the next step is for those, uh, Arizona fans, but anyways, that's going to be it for he- me here this afternoon. Uh, we will get Chris and James's reaction, obviously to the Phoenix coyote six situation there. And here in the upcoming days, and maybe we'll do an episode here on Monday or Tuesday uh, before the game, the Stars' last game on Wednesday. But just a really sad situation, and I really feel for Arizona fans. Anyways, guys, we had up to 41 of you here this afternoon listening live. Thank you, guys. There's even more of y'all who are tuning in later. Really appreciate you guys. We are so stinking excited. This just feels like the year for the Stars to win and go deep and go all the way to the final. And I'm speechless. I'm just excited. (laughs) I don't know what else to add on to that. Thank you to DraftKings Sportsbook for being our sponsor. Use that promo code THPN. And as always, StarCasterCamarks.com is the website go and check it out and go and check out my new blog post that kind of talks about my feelings for the arizona fan base along with nobody today it's just me my name is ryan this has been sarcastic remarks we will catch you guys on the flip side and we hope you guys have a fantastic morning afternoon evening whenever you guys are listening and we will be back with you guys again hopefully on monday or tuesday for an extended episode with both chris and james We will see you guys later. GG boys.